you everyone for coming today. This is the third of um, the African Studies lecture series for this academic year. And we are very, very happy to welcome Dr. Joyce Millen from Willamette University to deliver our final talk of this quarter. Um, I want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors of the African Studies lecture series, mostly the program in African Studies, the Oregon Humanities Center, the Clark Honors College, Global Oregon, we're all key sponsors. Um, in addition to a variety of departments, and we have a sheet at the back that says all of our lovely, lovely sponsors, 17 in all. So um, today we're going to be um, letting Professor Millen talk for about 60, 65 minutes, and then we're going to follow that up with a question and answer period. Um, there's coffee and tea and cookies in the back. Um, we understand some people are going to have to leave for class at 2. No one will be offended. And um, that's kind of going to be our format for today. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Joyce Mellon, who is currently an associate professor um, of anthropology at Willamette University, just up the road in Salem. She was originally trained in anthropology, but also has her master's in public health and also a master's in international relations. She came to Oregon after a long stint as a research fellow in social medicine at the Harvard Medical School, and there was the director of the Institute for Health and Social Justice. She is a former Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal, but we're not going to tell you when. And she was the author of many scholarly articles, chapters, and books, including um, Global AIDS, Myths and Facts, and the book Dying for Growth, Global Inequality, and the Health of the Poor. Today, she is going to be talking on Philobladarity, New Paradigms for a More Authentic African Independence. And thank you, Joyce, for coming. me to speak at this wonderful African Studies lecture series. Uh, it makes me uh, regret yet again that I live in Salem and not in Eugene. <laughs> but um, I'd like to also say thank you to the organizers, Melissa uh, and Daphne, and uh, Laura Massengill and Dennis Galvin. Thank you very much for organizing the series. Um, I'm pleased to present today a small piece of what is a much larger, uh, long-standing research project. Um, every single year since I was 10, I wake up one day in the year without my same, my normal voice. And that just happened to have been today. So excuse me, I hope I can keep through, <laughs> through the whole hour um, with this voice that's fading. Anyway, uh, the findings I present here today are based upon research of scholars and students in four countries, three continents over the past four years. I'll begin with images and stories describing some of the results of our study. And then I'll go back to explain why we've embarked upon this particular research and to review the main areas of inquiry and some of our findings. But first, a few remarks uh, about the research priorities and methodology. And this is to orient the non-anthropologist as to exactly what kind of research this is. Uh, the research is, in essence, multi-sided, meaning in multiple places. It's collaborative, students and faculty, as well as students and scholars from all the four different countries involved. It's longitudinal. It takes place over several years. It's ethnographic. Uh, it's, in, in other words, it's more qualitative and explanatory. It's also highly pragmatic. Uh, in other words, it's applied. So I'm an applied medical anthropologist, which means I work with agencies and organizations to try to help improve people's access to health care and also uh, health outcomes. And so this particular research was actually uh, not commissioned, that, that's not the word, but I was asked to do this by three different UN agencies and the African Union. The three different uh, UN agencies are the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, and the International Organization for Migration. So all of the results from our studies will go to them. Uh, in this research, uh, we have endeavored to incorporate several core research imperatives. Uh, of anthropological research. First, uh, and I'm telling you this so that you can follow it as I go to see, to see if we've actually succeeded. Uh, first is the comparative imperative. That is, for anthropological research, we are by nature comparative, cross-cultural. Um, and you will see that, that that's a fundamental core element of this particular research. As well, we're holistic. We don't just look at the economic systems or the sociological cultural systems. We look at the whole entire web of causation for phenomena. Okay, so it's, it's quite holistic, looking at using all the disciplinary 
uh, uh, dis disciplines uh, available to understand a particular uh, group of people or problem. Um, it's, it's also intersubjective, meaning multivocal. Uh, instead of just talking with the, the people who are the most voiced or the people who have the most power, the chief of the village or the leader of an organization, we endeavor to speak with everybody, uh, all the different constituencies. So in other words, uh, we also look at the people who have the least amount of power, who are least heard in society, um, and then every, everybody in between. So uh, it's, uh, it's very important that we get the intersubjective view. Also, it's processual. Uh, we endeavor to give a historical take. Uh, anthropologists are um, always looking at the origins of phenomena or the origins of a name, the origins of a problem, the origins of an issue, the origins of an organization. And we do that here as well, trying to find from the very beginning of, of a creation of something uh, exactly how it's transformed over the years. And then lastly, of course, it's participatory. So this is highly participatory. Um, all of the slides that you'll see here today, um, either I took or uh, one of my research associates took uh, in the last few years. Uh, we are taught as anthropologists to examine with precision and endeavor to deconstruct commonly held beliefs and conventional wisdom about everything. We're taught to question or problematize that which we most take for granted and to examine very attentively the narratives and the meta-narratives of our time. So we begin here today very broadly questioning the meta-narratives about Africa. As we all know, all together too well, the, uh, the meta-narratives about Africa are not positive. We are living in a long era of pervasive Afro-pessimism. The narratives are of endemic poverty, starvation, disease, burning villages, desperation, and despair. But of course, we know that these are not the only stories of Africa. So I'd like to take some time to share another set of stories and vastly different images of Africa that we don't typically see in the international media. The story begins in Ghana and in Senegal. As you know, Ghana is Anglophone and predominantly Christian, whereas Senegal is Francophone and predominantly Muslim. In both countries, uh, where healthcare needs are great, communities are celebrating the opening and inauguration of new and sophisticated medical clinics and facilities, such as this new rural health center in a village in the hottest, most arid region of far eastern Senegal, and this brand new district hospital in the western region of Ghana. And this rural based health center in a remote and difficult to access village in northern Senegal. And in urban centers as well, people are rejoicing in the opening of much needed health facilities and brand new modern hospitals. Such as this soon to be franchised micro clinic in Cape Coast, Ghana or this Poste de Santé in the city of Luga in Senegal. Uh, and this large and modern hospital in the city of Touba in Senegal, which is famous for being the home of the International Morid Brotherhood. Folks in West Africa are also celebrating the arrival of life-saving medicines, uh, as well as new and sophisticated medical equipment, such as mobile x-ray units, sophisticated microsco uh, microscopes for diagnosing disease, incubators to improve the survival of premature babies, pathology lab equipment to make diagnoses, ultrasound equipment, modern surgical equipment, as well as beds and other necessities for clinics and hospitals. Towns and cities and rural district villages are also celebrating the arrival of ambulances to transport sick people from remote areas to cities where they can access the health care they desperately need. 
And along with all these new rural clinics, urban-based hospitals, and the medical equipment and ambulances, state-of-the-art specialty care is popping up in towns and cities in Africa, including specialty care in reproductive health, in cardiothoracic care and surgery, and in orthopedic and spine care. In the very recent past, uh, wealthy Africans who uh, became ill and needed such specialty care were obliged to fly off to Europe or to the United States or elsewhere to receive such uh, specialty care. But the vast majority of Africans who couldn't afford uh, to leave their countries were basically left to um, succumb to whatever ailed them. In much of Africa, people still do die of very easily preventable and treatable diseases, but because of such new clinics and the specialty care, uh, fewer and fewer people are perishing for want of such care. Now, in 2008, Ghana opened its first postgraduate medical school. So today, Ghanaian physicians are trained in Ghana in this beautiful brand new facility to become pulmonologists, emergency room physicians, psychiatrists, dermatologists, radiologists, orthopedic surgeons, and other specialties. This new facility is also helping to deliver very important ongoing medical training, CMEs, continuing medical education, so that physicians can keep up with the latest developments in their specialty care. For areas of Ghana and of Senegal where there are still too few nurses and physicians, every few months physician volunteers from the United States and Europe arrive in groups. These are called medical missions or caravans. And they deliver sorely needed medical care and surgeries to children and adults in desperate need of specialty care. On a typical medical mission that can last between one and three weeks, 1,000 to 1,500 women and their families receive medical evaluations and 50 to 70 are surgically treated. That was in Ghana. Likewise, in Senegal, same thing. Uh, caravans are organized from Europe uh, to go to Senegal to respond to the needs of people in the more remote areas. So in this time of economic distress and rapidly diminishing aid dollars, we might wonder, who initiated, funded, built these new clinics, health facilities, and hospitals? Who supplied the medicines and the medical equipment? Who sent the ambulances to these communities? Who organized the medical missions? And, the, and who initiated and built the postgraduate medical school? Well, as you might think, uh, it was not the governments of Senegal and Ghana. It was not their ministries of health. Uh, the clinics and medical facilities were not built through bilateral aid, uh, and they were not donated from China. They were not initiated or funded through the development branches of international financial institutions, such as the IMF World Bank or the, or the um, African Development Bank. The United Nations had nothing to do with the building of these clinics nor the, uh, the school, um, nor did their special agencies, such as the World Health Organization, uh, which is devoted to health and uh, health care. Uh, neither did the International Red Cross and Red Crescent. They did not build these clinics. And importantly, neither did non-governmental organizations, foundations, or any other traditional agent of development. Likewise, it was not the private sector, businesses, or religious organizations that funded these. Rather, all of these medical facilities and medical resources were initiated, funded, built, or sent by ordinary, yet also extraordinary, African people who live and work in Europe or here in the United States. This is Ghanaian economist George Ayite, and I want to, well, let me explain. What he's, uh, he calls these people who have organized these efforts, who have brought these medical resources to their home communities. He calls these people cheetahs. Uh, they're not waiting for their governments, or they're not waiting for handouts, they're not waiting for foreign aid. These extraordinary African cheetahs are going about this work themselves. And I want to have George Ayite say this to you himself, so bear with me for just one second.
Let me see if this works. No volume. Is anybody like a volume? This one right here, yeah. Hmm. Any other ideas? Okay. Oh, look at that. Interesting. Okay, don't worry about it. Which one? How do you get back to the PowerPoint? Oops. This one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. You know, it's not imperative. Um, so. <laughs> All right. So if you need Mind. Sorry, bear with me for a second here. You have a review of all the amazing things. Oops. So I'll tell you what George Aite said <laughs> myself. He, um, like I said, he's a Ghanaian uh, economist. And what he says is that these people who are doing this phenomenal work, they're the cheetahs. Uh, they're fast-moving, incredibly entrepreneurial, uh, very successful, and uh, very much devoted to realizing efforts in their home communities in Africa in transparent and uh, accountable ways. Uh, now, he, he talks about how these are in striking contrast to the older leaders of Africa, who he calls the hippos, mm -hmm. the hippo leaders of Africa. By the way, you can see this on your own if you just look at uh, George Ayite, for it's a TED lecture, uh, and if you write just in Google, cheetahs and hippos, it'll come up. It's a 28-minute lecture that's phenomenal. And this is where he describes what the future for Africa will be like. And his view is it'll be about cheetahs and not hippos. And he says the, hippo, uh, the cheetahs, these fast-moving, entrepreneurial, uh, new folks in Africa who are very much devoted to bringing resources home, uh, these, these will be the savior for Africa, okay? Now, let me just uh, interject here really quickly some cur current events. So last week was the G20, right, in, Caen, in uh, France. And Bill Gates was invited to speak, um, as he usually is, at such a venues. And one of the things that he noted, I don't know if anybody saw this in the news, is he, he was trying to encourage the, the group of 20, the wealthiest countries in the world, uh, to re reconsider the notions of, African uh, development, but also how to finance African development because aid dollars are washing up given the uh, global economic downturn. And what he said is, uh, Africans in the diaspora, are. this is what he said, are sitting on $50 billion worth of resources, and it's a matter of how we tap into them. This was just last week. Um, also in September, so two months ago, interestingly, the, uh, uh, some, several important leaders from Kenya came to Washington, D.C. They were invited to D.C. to speak, and uh, they organized a conference with the uh, Kenyan embassy in D.C., and they invited uh, several hundred uh, members of the Kenyan diaspora, 
uh, of which there are several hundred thousand, 500,000 in fact, here in the United States. So several hundred members of the Kenyan diaspora came to this meeting in Washington, D.C. with these dignitaries from, from Kenya. And the point of the whole meeting was for the dignitaries in Kenya to say to the Africans who live here in the United States, invest in your country, buy bonds in your country. It was the first time anything like that had ever happened. But it's the notion of sort of tapping into these diaspora resources. So I want to introduce you to some of the um, amazing cheetahs who we've met along the way. Um, we've had uh, long, informed, key informant interviews, sometimes over several days, with some 48 of these cheetahs. And I'm going to introduce you to a few of them. Um, this is Bronx-based Dr. Abuafu, or Dr. Boafu. He founded an association called um, the Kwakaduam Association. And he, uh, he's an OBGYN in the Bronx, and he's a... Uh, working with his colleagues as well as his neighbors and church members to bring resources back to his home community in um, Akropong, Ghana. And interestingly, uh, when we first met him, we were very much impressed because we saw on his website, on the website for uh, um, uh, Kwakaduam, that they had received lots of different scholarships and different uh, 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 grants and funding from different agencies all around the United States and even globally. So we asked him, Dr. Boafu, here you are, you're a clinician, you have a whole waiting room full of people out there, and he teaches at Albert Einstein Medical School. He's obviously extraordinarily busy. It took us a long time to get in to see him. We said, when do you have time to do all this grant writing? Because he does, he does the grant writing for the association. And he got very excited, and he said, well, you see this chair I'm sitting in? See these little rollers here? Well, I can roll this chair from where I can examine a patient over to the computer, and when a patient comes in about 10 minutes late, I can spend some time writing sentences in the computer for a grant. And, and then his eyes lit up, and he said, and sometimes I have a cancellation, and then I can spend like a whole hour writing uh, paragraphs for these grants. Incredible. And then he, what he said is he spends all of his weekends and, and pretty much the evenings as well, devoted to writing these grants to get resources to bring huge water projects, health care projects, et cetera, back to his home community in Ghana. Likewise, this is Dr. Bwachi. Um, now, I, I'd like to, do you think the, the volume's not going to work on any of these, huh? Hi, Dennis. Well, this um, is worth taking a step back. Dr. Bwachi, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's uh, an internationally renowned uh, orthopedic surgeon specializing in scoliosis. And he uh, works in New York City at this uh, particular uh, spine care clinic. And uh, he's, he's quite well known. In fact, Discovery did a whole hour about him. And I wanted to show you part of that. Just gives, it gives his life and his background and everything. But unfortunately, I guess we don't have volume for that. So I apologize. In any case, Dr. Boachi is an absolutely extraordinary man. Um, and if you had scoliosis, a, a bad case of scoliosis in New York, you would be referred to this man, this particular surgeon, because he's, he's the best. Uh, in fact, he was just on Good Morning America, one of those early morning shows recently um, with one of his patients. In any case, he, um, he treats uh, pretty severe curvatures of the spine. And you would never know if you went to, to him that he's also the president of this organization, president and founder, FOCOS. Now, FOCOS um, has been operational since uh, 1998, and it does the same in Ghana as well as five other countries. So they treat uh, severe curvatures of the spine among very young children uh, because young children, if they have a very severe curvature of the spine, as they get older and they grow, the curvature tends to crush the lungs. And so such children die a rather painful, miserable death uh, due to uh, uh, lack of being able to breathe well. So Dr. Boachi, uh, in 1998, started to go back to his home country in Ghana and perform these spine surgeries for these young children who were uh, destined to live a short life. And little by little, he was able to coalesce colleagues from the International Scoliosis Society, other orthopedic um, uh, surgeons from around the world to come and volunteer their time every year, twice a year, in Ghana to provide these services. And so he, he continues to do this. And then he decided with his colleagues in Ghana that really there, there wasn't enough um, capacity at, at the teaching hospital, at the main teaching hospital, uh, Kolobu, in Accra. So what they really needed to do is create a new hospital. Uh, and so 
uh, along with his colleagues, and in conjunction with the state, and this becomes important, working with the Ghanaian state, he has just built a $4.5 million specialty care hospital of the most impressive sort, which I wish I could show you. At the end, we'll try to see about the volume again to show you this short video. But the, the um, hospital will be opening on December 1st. And one of my research associates left yesterday to attend the first uh, mission uh, of, uh, to treat spine um, scoliosis and spine injuries in that hospital. And I was there this summer um, as they were putting the final touches on this hospital. Uh, the government of Ghana gave them $1.5 million toward this endeavor, and they, uh, they, being Dr. Boachi and his whole collective of people in New York and elsewhere, were able to raise the rest. Uh, likewise with Dr. Boafu uh, from Akrapong, this particular physician as well spends all of his energy when he's not in surgery in New York City uh, raising funds and organizing activities for FOCOS. And I've seen it in both, in both places, in New York City as well as in Ghana, hence the, the uh, multi-sided nature of this research. We followed two migration uh, trajectories from Senegal to France and back, and then also from Ghana to the United States and back. Okay. So let me introduce you to two other cheetahs. Um, they're both, their first names are both Sheikh. And they both work for the same organization called Self Help in Luga, uh, in, in Senegal. And Sheikh Lo, uh, on the right, on your right, is um, in Italy. He works in Italy right now, and uh, he ha he suffers from complications due to polio, and he in fact he cannot walk. Um, but he works tirelessly in Italy, trying to coalesce the very large Senegalese. A community in his home in his town in Italy to bring resources back to educate people to raise funds etc to his hometown in, Lug in Luga. Likewise with Sheikh Sila on the left, uh, same deal. He works in Paris. He's also he has a struggle not of the physical sort but he was not educated. So he's been in Paris for 32, year, 32 years but does not read or write and I learned this because I was doing an informed consent with him and he said you'll have to explain that to me. And then he talked to us a lot about what it's like to live in Paris without the capacity to read and write, which is, as you might imagine, rather challenging. But likewise, uh, he too works tirelessly uh, after hours. This is his shop that you see here, uh, trying to coalesce his whole community of Senegalese people from Luga who live in Paris to bring resources back home. And they've done an absolutely enormous work in Luga. They've uh, redone hospitals, they've created new hospitals, they've done water projects, schools, you name it. It's uh, amazing. She might look familiar. I met her here at the University of Oregon a few years ago. This is Grace Kuto from Portland. Um, she is an administrator at uh, OHSU and author of um, a few books. She founded a center called the Harambe Center up in Portland. And this um, particular center uh, does as the others do. It brings, it brings people together to raise funds, raise awareness, and then uh, bring resources back to the home communities, including her own home community in Kenya. Uh, she comes from Kenya, but she also uh, works with several other uh, Africans in Portland to bring resources back to their home community as well. What she does is she, she's a phenomenal cook. So she, she, on the weekends and in the evenings, she's invited to different venues all around the Northwest, including up to um, Alaska, to host these dinners, these large, impressive dinners, where she does all the cooking, and then she teaches people about her home community and the, community, the other communities that uh, she's trying to help, and they raise funds. Now, interestingly, there's a, gen there's a gender dynamic that's quite interesting here. Uh, she and her husband uh, both come from the same area of Kenya. And when they go back to Kenya, even though Grace is the one who does almost all of the work here in the United States, raising the funds, doing the cooking, coalescing her community, etc., when they go back home, her husband uh, is the one in the limelight. He's the one who gets the credit, in a sense. And she's in the back uh, preparing tea for people. And we asked her about that, and she said, well, I'm telling you because it's the truth, but it doesn't really bother me because we're getting the work done. And if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. So more power to her. Um, this guy right here, this is his family. They live in Normandy, France. This is Abu Ali Khan. And I just spent a couple days with him and his family in Normandy. And interestingly, um, he came to France in, when he was in his early 20s. 
And uh, he worked as one of these garbage collectors on the street because he too was not well educated. And little by little has become um, uh, better off and, and now he's a recycling engineer. Uh, but he travels two to two and a half hours to work every day and then home. And the reason he does this is because he works in Paris. He lives in Normandy, so he takes the train in, actually two trains and then a bus and then walks to work, uh, to work for the garbage company, uh, primarily because he made this incredible connection with a township in Normandy called Val de Ré. And Val de Ré is a new town in France. We don't think of Europeans as having new towns, but this one was created by um, ex-president or former president George Pompidou, uh, primarily uh, to fix the congestion in Paris. So they created a new town in some fields, wheat fields, out in Normandy. And he makes this commute every single day back to Normandy so that he can work with the mayor of this town and this wonderful town that has come together in support of his home community in Senegal. And they have just completed a brand new, uh, beautiful health facility in uh, Dantadi, which is, this is the village I mentioned that was hard to get to. There's no road to this area, although they have an enormous catchment uh, of people who come to the, to the hospital. Now, unfortunately, uh, he worked with the mayor of, of Val de Rey, Normandy, and the whole community. They raised funds. They did what's called co-development, or now it's called co-solidarity, uh, through, the, through the French government. And they, they really, really collaborated nicely. But unfortunately, they didn't collaborate that well with the state of Senegal. So even though they had sort of permission from the Ministry of Health to build this hospital, uh, the ministry denied that. And so when it was finally built and they were waiting for their doctor to come to run the hospital, no doctor showed up. So this lasted for a while. And so finally the people of Dantadi, who are associated up in Val de Rey and in other parts of France, got together and said, well, look, if the government's not going to pay for the doctor, we will. So they paid for the doctor's salary for two years before the official opening of this particular medical center. Uh, and, uh, yeah, out of their own pockets, basically. Yeah. This is, this is the one I had showed you. This is it. It's a beautiful center. Uh, and now they, fortunately, after the uh, inauguration where they invited in the ministries and what, the ministers and whatnot, they, they got their doctor, thankfully. This woman, Nana Aysen Akiwowo, she's uh, from Ghana. Uh, she lives in New Jersey. How many of you have heard of Seventeen magazine? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay, everybody. Uh, she's the photo editor <laughs> of Seventeen magazine. Uh, she's a phenomenal woman. As you can see, she's young. Uh, but she uh, came to the United States when she was all of two years old. And after a series of events that happened, unfortunate events that happened to her own family, in particular her father, she decided that instead of going back home to Ghana every year, as she used to do with her friends and colleagues, uh, in the New York City area, what they used to do is they would go home and they would go to clubs and they'd go dancing. And she had a funny story. She said, my friends from Ghana who live in New York and in New Jersey, they would go back to Ghana over Christmas time and they would put on these tennis outfits and go to the country club. And they didn't even, they didn't even play tennis in the United States. In fact, some of them had never held a tennis racket. But for some reason, when they get to Ghana, they feel like they should be some kind of tennis player. So she said, you know, they could do better than that. And so she rallied them and she, and she created Africa Health Now. And what African Health Now does is it, it has large health fairs. So they go to uh, poor areas, um, mostly peri-urban around Ghana, and they bring in uh, doctors and nurses and specialists and they bring in resources like toothbrushes and um, all sorts of different things. And she teaches people, or they teach people about basic health and also diabetes care. Um, she's been very successful in doing this. And then there's a uh, founder and CEO of a successful computer software firm near Portland, Oregon. This is Matthew Essia, who single-handedly funded 12 large and very impressive uh, development projects in his home community in western Ghana, in the Brungahafo area, including the funding of the brand new district hospital that I showed you pictures of uh, previously. This is what he says. This is Matt talking. My lifelong dream is to be able to give back to my home community in Ghana. I am motivated by the needs of the people at the grassroots level and using the resources from, from here to help them. This, to me, is a calling. As a business person here who has been blessed with a business that has been successful, I can go directly to where the need is great and make an impact. 
Um, Matthew is an extraordinary man. This is the clinic that he built, or the, actually the district hospital that he built with his uh, foundation, the Matthew Essia and Family Foundation. Um, yeah, I could go on for about two years about that man. He's amazing. Uh, and this is um, uh, Abu Ngam. Abu Ngam was born in France, so he's a second generation uh, uh, migrant in France. Uh, and he was intrigued by uh, Senegal when he was just eight years old and went to Senegal for the first time. He didn't speak the language of his, fa of his parents, but he, brought, he was brought there by his father. And he just liked it a lot. And he became very much um, uh, enamored with the idea of spending his life going back and forth. And so instead of just sort of forgetting about this village, which was also a, a rather uh, poor village where he comes from, he decided to uh, gather together all of his buddies from school and start projects in his village in Senegal. And so for nine years, every year, he worked with his schoolmates, mostly who were French, some from North Africa, from other parts of the world, um, 10 to 12 every year, to bring resources back to his home community in Senegal. Uh, and they went every summer, and they would build, uh, they, they helped build a clinic, they helped build a market, they did agricultural, water projects, you name it. Um, and that's his daughter, so he's kind of retired from that activity for, for the moment. Um, others who work long hours each day to keep our urban centers clean and tidy also partake in efforts to bring health resources to their home communities in Africa. Um, and retirees who worked for decades on car manu manufacturing firms in Europe, assembly lines in Europe, are now working tirelessly to organize their um, diaspora communities to bring urgently needed medical care and expertise to their Senegalese-based families. Uh, does, that, does this room look familiar to any of you? This is in a foyer, one of the rather infamous foyers. <laughs> Laura's shaking her head. One of the infamous foyers in uh, Paris. There are dozens of them. And I have a great video I wanted to show you. It was only a minute long. OK, yes, let's try again. OK, let me see if I can get this for you to see. Oh, how do I get there? Here it is. So let's see. So here it is. You can at least see the, oh, here you go. Well, actually, it's in French, so it doesn't matter. It's the pictures I wanted you to see on this one. Look at these pictures. Look at them carefully. Actually, while I'm here, let me just show the. Oh, let me just show the photographs. I'm going to show you um, one other since we're here, just so you can see this. Just to be able to show you the hospital that Dr. Boache has created.
the pictures that you just saw are of the foyers, called infamous because they are not well cared for, to say the least. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because people, like the elderly people that you saw in that meeting, uh, they meet every week on Sundays typically uh, with people, their compatriots, to organize themselves to, again, bring resources back home. And some of them have lived in these foyers for decades. The foyers are, the ones that we were in, are all male, somewhere between 350 to 550 uh, people living in very small rooms with these collective kitchens. And most of the foyers are not well kept at all. And in a sense, we could say these guys are, in, in essence, sacrificing their life to live in these foyers so they can bring resources home. This is very, very difficult for people from Europe and the United States to, quite, to understand. And this is sort of the heart of part of our research is, why do they do this? And, 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 and you know, what, what, what do they get out of it? That's the sort of attitude I think Americans typically would have. Uh, but it's very different for them. And that's, uh, it gets to the heart of the title of this particular talk. Philobladarity, or philobladarity, however you want to say that. That's the combination between philanthropy, obligation, and solidarity. Okay, Because, as I'll tell you in a moment, okay, there we are, perfect, very nice. Um, well, let me, I'll tell you that in a second. But this is, this is in one of these foyers. This is actually a really nice foyer um, compared to some of the others that we had seen. Um, but do you see how old these guys are? They're not young, yet they do. They, they spend their life uh, working usually in uh, restaurants or as guardians or, as you'll see in the next slide, selling trinkets on the streets. How many of you guys have been to Europe lately? OK, so have you been to a major tourist venue? All right, so you've met these guys. Um, they're, they're out in strong numbers. Um, and many of them, many of them who are selling these trinkets on the street, in this case, they're selling Eiffel Towers. Uh, many of these guys come from the Mori Brotherhood from Luga, so a large brotherhood, uh, 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 Muslim brotherhood, that's uh, quite well known for its social solidarity. So they're organized into what's called Dayura, and they uh, bring resources back home. I wanted to show you, here they are selling trinkets on the street. These a high percentage of what it is that they earn, a very high percentage, um, goes back to their Dayura to create uh, projects, uh, health facilities and whatnot in their home community in Tuba. Now, Tuba has just opened, as I showed you, this very impressive um, Class A hospital, uh, which is beautiful, it's large, it's modern, and it's incredibly necessary because that community didn't have anything at all like this prior to the building of this particular hospital. And again, the proceeds from these trinkets on the streets uh, and the knockoffs that you see being sold in New York City and elsewhere, the proceeds, a lot of those proceeds go home to these public uh, facilities. I'm going to show you, I don't know, is it worth showing you? It is? Okay, let me show you quickly. One other, um, all right, so how do I get there fast? It's uh, this one. So I want to show you what their life is like, their day-to-day -day life, the guys selling trinkets on the streets. And maybe you've seen some of this. There should be something there. There's nothing there. This was supposed to be a little bit more seamless. But uh, let me just tell you then. Don't worry about it. Let's just go back to the slideshow. Um, these guys are chased, basically, all the time by the police. <laughs> I just spent um, two weeks in September in Paris. I rented a little tiny apartment right at the base of the Eiffel Tower. You can't call it an apartment. It was microscopic, a room. And just in order to be able to hang out with these guys, and I did for two weeks straight, and watched them get harassed and chased, etc. Now something very sad happened on August 19th of this year. Did you guys know about what happened? So a young man from, um, from Senegal, uh, actually not that young, in his 30s, uh, he was a tailor in Senegal. He decided to try to become a tailor in, um, in France to earn a little bit more money when his tailoring business wasn't doing so well in Senegal. So he went up to France, and he couldn't get into the tailoring market. And so he started to sell trinkets on the streets uh, with, 
with, <laughs> with these guys. These guys in French are called les vendeurs à la sauvette, so sellers of things sort of under the table. In any case, he was doing it for about six months. He told his sister that he hated the work and he couldn't wait to stop doing it so he could get a legitimate job as a tailor. But in the meantime, he was doing this. So on August 19th, the police, in their typical way, uh, went chasing after these guys. And what I wanted to show you was just a series of chase scenes that I had witnessed. Um, but we're not going to do that. That's okay. That's perfect. Thank you. No, it's good. Thank you. I appreciate your help. So anyway, so, so here these guys are, and they're always, when they're selling trinkets to you, they're looking left and right because the police are going to come after them. So what happened on August 19th, the police came, went, policemen went after them. Hundreds of them fled into the next arrondissement. That's what they do. They go to the next one over because the police only have jurisdiction in their own arrondissement. But one guy uh, was hotly pursued, and he ran into the subway and jumped into the subway and was electrocuted. Two weeks later, he died. And so this has been... So when I arrived at the beginning of September, as you can imagine, it was very tense at the base of the Eiffel Tower and on all the other venues. And now the uh, French government has really cracked down. Whereas before, these guys would, would be fined. They'd have a slap on the wrist, sent home, or they'd be fined a little bit. Now they can be fined up to 3,750 euro and six months in jail, okay, because they don't have the permit to sell. That's precisely why. So in any case... Um, you see that uh, it was ordinary and extraordinary African people who brought all these health centers, resources to their home communities in Africa. These are what uh, uh, George Yite would call the cheetahs. Uh, they're not waiting for their governments. They're not waiting for foreign aid uh, to bring health resources home. They're doing it themselves, and in the process, they're changing the face of development in Africa today. So my research has been devoted to several questions about these cheetahs and their work. First of all, uh, what is this work called? Uh, again, in the literature, we call it Diasporas for Development. There's a lot of literature about this right now, a lot. Um, but if you talk to any of these guys, they're going to say, I'm not doing development. Development has bad connotations, uh, as you probably know. I'm not doing development. That's not what I'm doing. They say, I'm doing solidarity work, or this is just what I do because I've been able to come to America or to Europe and to be able to work. So therefore, I should be able to bring resources home to help the people who helped me get here. It's a form of an obligation, but a very honorable one and a positive one. So in a, in a sense, it's philanthropy. It's an obligation, and it's solidarity. And that's, what they, that's, that's how they define it. That's why I called this philobladarity. Uh, did any of you like, look that up in the dictionary? Because it's not in there yet. Uh, so the questions I had is, why do they take on these? Now, something very interesting happened when I was in Paris. I was uh, meeting with a, a colleague, and he said, you know, have you seen this article that came out last year called The Family, The Worst Enemy of Africa? And it was an article that went around. It was from Les Africains, uh, a, a weekly journal, economics journal, and it was written by a guy named George Yang. And this article went like wildfire through the African community. And what it argued, uh, troublingly in my mind, is that really Africans would do a lot better in our countries, France, he was writing from a France, French perspective, or in the United States, if they could just sort of let go of their families and be more egotistical. I kid you not, that's the word he used. So the whole article is all about how the reason Africa is not developing well is because people are too tied to their families and their families are too dependent upon them, and the people who do make it can't really make it because they have to send monies home. So when I talked to my African colleagues about this, they were aghast and said, wow, is that how Europeans and Americans think of us? Holy mackerel, turn something really positive like solidarity, et cetera, into something quite, quite negative. In any case, so there's the question. Why do they take on these projects? And again, my, my firm belief is it's very difficult for us in the West or America or Europe to really, really understand the fundamental core reasons why they do this work. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's good work for an anthropologist to embark upon, to try to explain it in a qualitative sense. And then also I've, I've been interested in why or how do they accomplish these projects while living and working abroad? I mean, many of them have really serious challenges just integrating into the countries, their host countries. 
Uh, so why aren't they just spending more money just trying to integrate? Uh, we want to understand this. With whom do they collaborate? This one is enormously important. Do they collaborate with the people in their host country? Do they collaborate with people in the home country? And whom? Okay. And what I'm most interested in understanding is do they collaborate with the state and how does that work? Um, what obstacles and challenges do they face in their work? Um, what we found is there are many. Uh, and it depends upon where they've ended up and uh, whether or not they're educated and whether or not they've been educated in that country. For example, the two doctors that I introduced you to at the very outset, Dr. Boafo from uh, the OBGYN versus Dr. Boachi, both from Ghana, the orthopedic surgeon. Dr. Boafo was um, trained in Ghana, and Dr. Boachi was trained in the United States. Now, Dr. Boachi, trained in the United States, has a whole lot of medical school buddies who are making a boatload of money that he went to school with in New York City that he can tap into those resources, whereas Dr. Boafo doesn't, in a sense. He's um, more relying on his church and his neighbors. So uh, some of those things are, are quite different. And also, we've been interested in the obstacles and challenges they face, and also uh, whether or not what they're doing is really making a difference in their, um, the overall health of their home communities. So our, our work has sort of uh, come out of a response to two trends. And I'm going to go through these very, very briefly. I mentioned at the outset that I was going to show you the data, in a sense, and then go back and tell you why. This is, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, as you probably know, the world is suffering from a crisis in human resources for health. Uh, there are just not enough doctors and nurses. Even this country, we're suffering from this crisis. We have to put that in perspective. But uh, we only train 75% of our health workforce. That means 25% of it comes from abroad. And oftentimes, it comes from poor countries. Uh, in 2006, the World Health Organization wanted to tackle this issue, wanted to understand it. And so they did the annual State of the World's Health report all on the human resources for health crisis. And they noted that there are 57 countries in the world that are really suffering from this crisis. And as you see here, almost all of them are in Africa. Shockingly, over 818,000 African doctors and nurses have left the continent since the year 2000. We're the great beneficiaries of these amazing brains. So there's been a lot of amusings, uh, musings in the, uh, in the literature uh, to, to understand why this is and to understand uh, from economics perspective mostly whether or not this is a, you know, a benefit or, some kind, or a deterrent to uh, health systems in Africa. And frankly, the, uh, the uh, jury is still out on this, um, although I have my own opinion about it, which we can talk about during questions and answers. In any case, their efforts fall, as I've said, under this rubric of diasporas for development. Um, just briefly, uh, the problem of, of health worker shortages in Africa has become so acute in many parts of Africa. The authors of the State of the World's Health Annual Report stated this, the exodus of skilled health professionals in the midst of so much unmet need places Africa at the epicenter of the global uh, workforce crisis. And the crisis, as you can imagine, has profoundly disturbing geopolitical consequences. So ref reflecting on these geopolitical implications, uh, two well-known migration scholars said this. This is a case in which poor countries are subsidizing rich countries, since African governments paid to educate many of the health workers who are leaving. As a result, there have been some discussions about notions of reparations or some kind of payback to the African countries. This is quite common where tertiary education in most of Africa still is covered by the government. So if a physician uh, goes to school on the government payroll or whatever, uh, when they leave, uh, that's, a, that's a terrible net loss to the country. And, th and, and economists have spent a lot of time calculating what that net cost is. And it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, as you might imagine. And there have been all sorts of efforts to either bond the physicians, requiring them to spend some time before they can go, or requiring them to pay back the government if they go into the private sector or if they go out of the country, all sorts of different mechanisms, what they call retention schemes, to keep doctors in country, et cetera, uh, most of which have failed. Um, some of them in Ghana have succeeded somewhat, but elsewhere not so much. Uh, and in any case, the, the migration still continues. So you guys know this. I'm not going to spend time with this. But we used to call the uh, 
without migration of skilled laborers, uh, brain drain. We don't use that term so much anymore because it uh, doesn't reflect what's truly happening. What's really happening is now called brain circulation. People are moving back and forth. Some people refer to these people who move back and forth to their home countries uh, and to their host countries as seagulls or birds uh, because they're flying around a lot. So uh, again, we don't also use the term brain drain so much anymore because it doesn't give much um, credibility to the people who remain in Africa as if they don't have brains. Uh, but now we're also talking about brain gain and brain this, brain that. Brain gain is this notion of diasporas for development. The exodus of medical personnel out of Africa is particularly of great concern as it has intensified in recent years at just the moment in time when African countries, especially those in southern Africa, um, with the highest prevalence of HIV AIDS, were in greatest need of health care workers. As noted earlier, uh, this problem is considered a full-blown crisis. So in the wake of the crisis, there has been a concerted effort on the part of a lot of United Nations agencies and others to promote diasporas for development with a, with a very, very keen focus on physicians and, boy, I don't know where those came from. I didn't put those there. <laughs> wow. Um, with a keen focus on the, um, the physicians. So, um, so much so, trying to tap into the, or leverage the resources and the skills of the physicians abroad or the skilled laborers abroad, uh, former UN Secretary General and Special Advisor on Africa, Joseph Laguela, reported before the first meeting of the African Diaspora Leadership Forum in London in 2006. He said this, the African Union has recognized the diaspora as an important stakeholder. The diaspora is now seen as the sixth region of Africa. 20 seats on the AU's Economic, Social, and Cultural Council are reserved for African organizations. And then he continued, and he said this, diaspora groups possess many unique strengths, such as good knowledge of the culture and the specific needs of their countries and communities of origin, the ability to work in different cultural settings, long-term personal commitment to the development of their communities, and, importantly, the ability to gain the trust of their communities. If ever there was a time for, African di for Africa's diaspora to provide additional impetus for African development, it is now. And the United Nations and African Union are not alone. Recently, an impressive number of multilateral institutions and agencies, non-governmental agencies, etc., have launched initiatives to leverage the skills and resources of Africa's diaspora. And I have a list of about 40 different organizations, which I won't for you with, but they're numbered. Um, much of this current enthusiasm, however, for mobilizing diasporas for development uh, rests with in, sort of intuitively compelling, though, what I would consider to be rather seriously under-examined assumptions about the motives, experiences, capabilities of diaspora individuals and groups. Uh, and this is what motivated my work, is, is tackling some of these assumptions. Uh, for example, is it true, as is often assumed, that members of the diaspora know the specific needs of their communities? Hmm. Uh, we might assume so, because that's where they come from. But a lot happens when you migrate, as you know. So if people have been away for 5, 10, 15, 20 years without circulating back frequently, those needs change. And so the person, especially if they were trained as a medical provider here, go, they go back home and they're sort of consideration of what's a medical problem or a health problem might be quite different from those people who uh, have remained at home. Uh, so in other words, how might this knowledge have changed over time according to the duration away from home or new influences diaspora individuals gain abroad? Another assumption is that members of the diaspora have the ability to gain the trust of their communities and therefore would work respectfully within local socio-political hierarchies and government structures. This is also an assumption. Um, it's a good, they're all good assumptions, right? Um, but oftentimes the migrant, the person who has left the community, left with one status and then ages and comes back and attempts to assume another status where the people at home believe they're still at that former status. Uh, likewise, they start to forget the hierarchical functioning. I, we see this mostly in Ghana with the, uh, the kings and the, and the queen mothers and, and how to pay respect and, and how to work within the institution this, um, uh, to be able to get the, the work done. And there's a lot of friction sometimes when people go home because they don't quite understand the hierarchical structure and they don't fit in nicely into the uh, local governance structures. 
Another assumption states that members of the diaspora would necessarily bring longer-term commitments to their efforts. And while, again, a good assumption, I would say probably most have that in mind, that that's their aim because it's their family, after all, that's assuming that economic systems remain stable and that people are always gaining the same amount and we don't have economic downturns and people aren't laid off and, and this sort of thing. So while they might have the idea to bring resources home permanently and to continue on permanently, it's not necessarily always feasible to do so. And um, diaspora individuals and associations in their development effort, uh, efforts would employ their knowledge of the local to build upon indigenous systems rather than imposing foreign values as traditional agents of development often do. Uh, this again, uh, we want to think this, but if you look in terms of health in particular, so again, most of these doctors and nurses and healthcare providers are working in our modern healthcare system here, or our uh, biomedical healthcare system here. And when they go back home, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to work with the indigenous healers, uh, the traditional healers. It might be that they would ignore them. Uh, now, some, actually, of our large sample size, only one actually has endeavored to go back and work with the indigenous healers. Again, that's an assumption uh, that we ought not make. Focusing on diaspora efforts and health in particular, we can assess these assumptions. For example, on the last point I just noted concerning the indigenous, I just explained this, I won't go over it again, sorry. Uh, most of the assumptions regarding the virtues and benefits of diaspora involvement ignore the often profound changes of the diaspora that diaspora members experience in their lives abroad. Um, while the push for increased diaspora involvement may be based in part on desires to break African, Africa's harmful cycles of dependence on foreign powers and banks and development agents, uh, the questions we raise here and others show that the desire is based upon under-evaluated assumptions. So these were some of our basic research questions. Um, what do individuals in the diaspora or the diaspora associations, uh, what exactly do they bring home? Uh, now we've learned that there's rural clinics and hospitals, there's specialty care, there's all the equipment, there's enormous resources and enormous, there's small, medium and, and impressively large projects, so the gamut. Uh, we've also learned um, that there do seem to be stages of engagement. Um, this makes sense that people who are younger, who aren't as well established in their careers, tend to give less. Uh, and then little by little, they get pressured from the older people who are in the diaspora to give more. Uh, now, we learned all sorts of strategies that some of the elders have to get the younger people to uh, con contribute collectively. There's a word in French. You guys know this word, cotisation? We don't have a great word for that in English, but it means to collect or to contribute collectively. And so the elders are trying to get their younger uh, compatriots to collect, uh, and sometimes they call home the... <laughs> The elders that you saw in the foyer, they literally, they'll call back to Senegal to the mother or father of one of the migrants who's selling trinkets on the street and say, hey, all of his friends contributed to this uh, endeavor, but, you know, Abdu didn't yet, so you better call him and tell him to put in his five euros. A lot of pressure in this regard. Um, and these are some of the other more salient questions. Now, the most important one in my mind and the one that's most relevant for the people um, at the international uh, institutions I mentioned and, and also the, uh, the AU, they're interested in how and why and what they do with the state. Now, that also runs the gamut. Uh, one of the communities, uh, Kungani in, in Senegal, they don't work with the state at all. In fact, they're very proud of that. They'll say categorically, what state? They're right at the border with Mauritania. Mauritania is right across the Senegal River and they have a lot of liaisons with the village across the river and they'll say, what do you mean, the Mauritanian state? We'll say, no, the Senegalese state. And they're like, well, the Senegalese state has never been here. All the development projects that you see in this Soninke village, all of them, our um, migrants abroad have brought. And they're impressive. Now, granted, the Soninke were the earliest of the migrants out of West Africa to go to Europe. Um, but they have 100 years of experience at this point bringing resources home. They do not work happily, in any case, with the state. Although I think some of the younger, more educated people coming up um, seem to have a different attitude, so this might change. Um, and then also, you get uh, people who work well with the state in France, like the Dantavi people who work with the, the mayor and the, and the town of, of Val de Rey, but they don't work with the state in Senegal. And part of this is just a, a massive distrust 
There's a multidimensional distrust that goes on uh, among all parties concerned. Uh, and that's, it's most unfortunate. But I think it harkens back to the legacy of colonialism and some of the psychological wounds of colonialism as to who is capable of doing development and who is not. Um, but this mistrust is also um, impeding, I think, some of the best efforts because people refuse to work with the state. And then these are um, some of the challenges that the cheetahs face. There are many, many, many challenges. But because we worked in four countries, every country is different. Like France, for example, right now, France has become very adept at working with the diaspora members from Africa, all over Africa, mostly Francophone, but um, all over Africa. And they have uh, millions of dollars to do so from three different ministries. We spoke with the, minister, the, the person who's in charge of working with members of the diaspora, these collectivités, as they call them, uh, in France at the, ministère, the, uh, the Minister of um, Foreigners. And she uh, told us that the, the um, actual funds for working directly with the diaspora is actually going up. They ha they're going from $8 million this year to $10 million, which is really unusual uh, for Europe at this point to have anything, have an increase. Um, but you have to look back at the whole history of this, what they call co-development. Some of it's actually kind of evil. Uh, the idea was to prevent uh, people from uh, coming over to France or to get people to go back home. I and mean, that's the fundamental core reason why they do the co-development projects. Not really to help people survive longer and have better water. And, you know, it's, to, it's so that people don't come to France. So the different ministries, the Minister de l'Intérieur, the Minister of the Interior, uh, they're kind of on the policing side. So they offer funds for people who will go home. Uh, and then the, uh, the Minister of, of Foreigners, they're more working in the development sphere. But the United States doesn't have anything like this. Have you ever heard of anything like this? We don't have anything like this. In fact, when we were speaking with the woman who was at the, minist the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreigners, Foreign Affairs, she said uh, apparently Hillary Clinton has been reading their material and is very much interested in trying to get into this so that we actually here in the United States, on an official level, at the state level, actually encourage and promote um, diaspora efforts. So that will be an interesting thing to watch in the future. Now, a lot of these other things are very, very important, uh, such as employment rigidities. And we don't have forced retirement here in this country. So doctors can work until whenever they want to. Whereas in, in France, they have to retire at 62. Okay? So when they retire, they obviously lose uh, the ability to earn more funds. Therefore, they don't have as many funds to be able to bring resources home, et cetera. Uh, so there's, there's differences in that regard as well. Even postal rules. It's now against the law in, the, in Europe to send medicines at, from a private person. I guess uh, pharmaceutical companies can, but private institutions and uh, associations can't send medicines overseas. So as, whereas in the past, they used to send big boxes home to their home communities so that the nurses and the doctors could have the medicines right there instead of having to pay a lot more, perhaps locally. Uh, they can't do that anymore, whereas the Ghanaians do that all the time. And they have all sorts of interesting systems for how they do that. So all these others are important as well. The rules of incorporation, how to get you know, uh, nonprofit status. Our 501c3 status here in the United States is far easier to access than uh, their 1901 statutes. That's what they're called in France. Um, OK, so I think I'm pretty much out of time here. So just to end on a positive note, um, there's an awful lot of mir sort of miraculous, wonderful work. Uh, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny sampling of what's out there. Um, we've uh, been collecting newspaper articles of other amazing works, and because we're a small little organization, we can't go around and do all of them. And it's only we only looked at two African countries. It's happening all over the continent. A few years ago, I attended the uh, first um, Human Resources for Health conference held in uh, Uganda for the for the world. WHO organized it. There were people from all over all over Africa who were endeavoring to do this kind of work. So our, our concern is to have them do it well, to be able to have the elders who are doing this work well give them advice, uh, to be able to have the, the chiefs and, and the kings and the organizers of these associations be able to tell them what they've done, what's worked, what hasn't, or the challenges they've met along the way, et cetera. So uh, at the end of this, we'll be producing a documentary film to be able to let the, the people themselves actually tell their stories so that younger people who are endeavoring to do this work can uh, take their advice. Thank you. So, questions? Yes. I had a, I, I had a couple. I'll try to get them quickly here for me. Uh, um, 
Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, definitely. And so I, I, the first question I wanted to ask um, is how many of the people who you encounter who are doing this kind of work are crossing boundaries? So, for example, where you have Ghanaian doctors who might, for example, have family in Togo, right. uh, who are now, who then, you know, in the Togolese, uh, some of the Togolese communities, or in the case of people who are on the border of Mauritania providing service to Mauritanian families, but there are often English communities right, in Mauritania right, right, right. are an internationally crossing these boundaries. I'm glad. Right yeah. The, the, the second question, if I can uh, sort of add there, that is, is the the, the, uh, the sort of you know remittance of, of effort and remittance of finances in, in a sense of building these organizations overseas, is that uh, you know how how real is the danger of building a new dependency mm. on that? Absolutely. Okay. No, great question. Uh, the first question I should I should mention um, in France, in, in um, Paris and the outskirts of Paris, there are two distinct organizations called the Médecins d'Afrique. They're both the same name, which is kind of contested. One started in Senegal, and the other one started in, in Congo Brazzaville. Um, in any case, they are Médecins Sans Frontières, but all Africans, and they work in multiple countries around the continent. Uh, mostly francophone, they're trying to get in more into anglophone, um, which is a really w wonderful example of crossing borders. Dr. Boachi, the orthopedic surgeon, he brings in people from Ethiopia, children from Ethiopia, from Sierra Leone, Liberia, and from all the neighboring countries of Ghana. And he also works in Barbados. I'm not sure how that happened. But um, so they're definitely, I think it's linkages with a particular orthopedic surgeon who he had had some conference or something with. So there's definitely efforts in that regard. Now, Nana Aysen Akiwowo from um, Ghana, she's married to a Nigerian, which is so rare, a Nigerian married to a Ghanaian, but she is. And they're trying to do stuff in, in, in Nigeria as well, some of these health fairs. I'm not sure, I haven't spoken with her in recent months. I'm not sure if they've made any inroads with that or not. Um, but I think there's definitely some of that. I don't, you know, I think what I noted this year in Paris is there's so much more pan-African when they leave Africa because there's, they're, they live with people from all over the continent. And the television, in these foyers, everyone has a television in the foyers. They're, they're hooked into the channels from like 12 different African nations. So they'll tell you about what's going on in the Congo, what's going on in Togo and Benin, and whereas you don't really necessarily have that in, in Senegal or Togo. It's more sort of local. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think it will see more and more of that. Plus I think the young people, again, when they go to school, they're also uh, meeting. Uh, people from all parts of the world, and it's not just you know the uh, crossing borders and boundaries in Africa, but it's it's the world uh, trying to uh, get their whole res uh, migrant community that's in nine different countries together. The technology in this is, is amazing; it's really impressive. So the second question about kind of sustainability. Um, this is a, this is a the reason I kept harping on the attention to the state is because obviously you want the state to take over these things. I mean, isn't the state's responsibility to care for its citizens? So you don't want the, uh, the, the, um, the associations or these individuals to have to build district hospitals and that sort of thing. And when I ask people about that, they say, oh, well, if we just sat and waited for the state, we'd be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So our people are dying and they need health care, so we're going to do it ourselves. So is that a risk? Yeah. I mean, it's taking full responsibility away from the from the government in a sense. And, and, and likewise, it's, it's enabling the financial institutions, the international financial institutions who were so disastrous in Africa in the 1980s and 90s to get off the hook for some of the structural adjustment policies that were devastating to the health sectors because now the diaspora members are taking up the slack and they're building these things. So that's a problem. Uh, people didn't like to talk about that because they're very pragmatic. They want things and they want them now. Uh, and who can blame them, right? Who can blame them? But yeah, these are these are important questions. Yeah. Yes, Brenda. So um, I have a lot of thoughts anyway. Who knows what they're going to articulate? Um, one of the things. 
things people kept talking about when I was at Stanford when mm -hmm. I was um, just the expectations that people have back in their country. Oh, sure. Yeah. So much pressure on, you know, why is there, you know, is it just linked to sort of ideas of the U.S. and of Europe, or is it, you know, linked to something else? So. Uh, well, it, it, that's big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think part of it, you were with Mauritanians, and this is relatively new for Mauritanians, so I think that the expectations are going to be even bigger. Uh, if you look at some of the more long-standing uh, villages and areas in Ghana or, you know, among the Soninke perhaps that have been doing this for years and years and years, the expectations are different. Mm -hmm. I think it's the newer ones, like the Lugatwa, the people from Luga, they have high expectations. These are more recent migrants. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of it is because the, the people come back, the migrants go back home, they put on the nicest grand booboo that they would never wear in Europe, and they play the big person, right? And we see a lot of that, unfortunately. Uh, the good thing is uh, radio stations and television stations, even comedians in uh, different parts of Africa are starting to catch on to how this is a problem. Mm -hmm. And also, um, because immigration to uh, Europe right now is just not a good thing um, because of all sorts of reasons. Whenever there's an economic downturn, we, we blame the immigrants, right? Um, and there, that's happening in a major big way in, in Europe right now. So it's not easy. It's, uh, and it's getting much more difficult for these Maurits to sell their trinkets on the streets and, and whatnot. So the, that's getting out. So people are starting to understand at the home level the, the uh, trials and tribulations of their brothers and sisters abroad. Um, but I think the expectations, um, yeah, come from some of that. It's complicated complicated. And plus, I mean, if you were sick and, and needed health care and you saw that, you know, your family member had access to those things. But also I think it's tied in this article that was so interesting. Uh, the family, the enemy, the worst enemy of Africa. Uh, he, the, the, uh, the author argues that um, these ideas of solidarity, he doesn't call it solidarity, of dependence, are uh, in the blood. Uh, in Africa, you're born into that. It is a part of your upbringing in every way, shape, and form. And so it just makes sense in the sense that those expectations are with the brother, just like they would be with the brother who goes into the city to get work. They come back and they bring resources home. Yeah? Right. Or that everyone assumes that the person has what they have. Yeah. What you're talking about is there's another private kind of family member to family member or friend to friend. Um, that competition exists as well between villages. So if one village gets a beautiful new health center, well, the, the guys who live up in France or who live here in New York, they're going to get together and, and, and do something, which is actually an interesting way that things are developing, the pressure, I mean, it, it infuriates the government because the government wants to make the last decision as to exactly where those health centers should go, where to put the nurses, where to put the doctors. Um, but the, the communities themselves are motivated through competition. And people talk about that openly. Um, so it goes to the family, private, as well as at the public level as well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've already touched on this somewhat, I think. Mm. That's a good question, Dor. Are they kind of wary about it? Do they reject it? Um, um, okay, I can talk about it at the global level and then more specifically. At the global level, this is relatively new. This is kind of cutting edge. Uh, African countries, until very recently, in the last 10 years, really kind of rejected their migrants mm -hmm. the, the, at the state level, at the official level. The, the, the idea was they're out there in greener pastures, let them be there. They've, they've abandoned us. Let them stay there. 
But then uh, the Asian governments, in particular India and Malaysia, uh, became very adept at leveraging the resources and the capacities of their skilled laborers abroad. And so Africans started to say, hey, we can do that too. So Nigeria was the first. It brought in dual citizenship. And then it started to change the banking laws, the citizenship laws. So it became a lot more seamless to be able to do the circulation migration. Now, little by little, all the countries are following suit. Ghana now has dual. Senegal doesn't yet. Uh, you know, they're following suit with uh, banking, citizenship, and some other. So they also have created, many African governments have now created whole ministries that are devoted to diasporas. Senegal has the Ministère um, des Senegalais à l'extérieur. Okay. Um, and Ghana has, they changed the name of it recently. It was originally created as the Ministry of Diaspora, was it Ministry of Diaspora Affairs and Tourism, which infuriated the people in the diaspora. Like, wait a minute, we shouldn't be linked with tourists. So they took, when Atamils came in, he took off the tourism part. Um, but this, is, this has been promoted, actually, this creation of new ministries to actually deal with um, the members of the diaspora have been promoted by a lot of the UN agencies, as well as you know through bilater bilateral um, uh, work as well. And you know part of this is, is to uh, let people abroad vote. Now in Nigeria, if you live abroad, you can vote, and other countries as well. You can really take part. You can become a real seagull. You know you can live in both worlds, um, or in neither, as the case may be, and circulate and uh, take part. I mean now we have all the technology to do that. Most of my African friends here talk every day to home, somebody at home, right? And so when they do their development projects, it's quite a bit different from the past when you kind of send the money home and you have <laughs> you pray that things are going to happen the way you want them to. Now they're like getting pictures of things and such, right? Uh, so the, 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 uh, the local government uh, applauds that because it's helping them do their work. At the same time, there's a lot of distrust um, uh, about the um, motivations and, and the resources and such. So, you know. Both ways, yeah. yeah. There, I, there aren't real fast rules for any of this. There's so much diversity, which is why I, I have trouble with the economists, uh, because they are making gross generalizations using aggregated statistics from government figures to say it's either good or it's bad, it's helpful or it's harmful, um, when it's quite a bit more nuanced than that. Yeah. Any other questions? Must be Daphne, okay. and you look like you're in the urge of asking a question. I keep thinking about um, the intern of the idea that I don't feel like a lot of the idea of if you purchase India mm -hmm. as a business idea, feel that the to work with the diaspora. Government Well, that's just my perspective, not yeah. necessarily their perspective. But the people in the associations who live abroad don't want to finance things for the rest of their lives, right? They want the government to take it over so they can move on to something better, or you know, a college. In the so they're thinking more in terms of capital efficiency. Yes. That's a very, very good point. That's been one of the major complaints. Yeah, I mean, the difference between consumptive versus generative remittances. Most of what they're providing, although public, is not generative. It's not generating jobs. Uh, and the people on the ground are the ones complaining most about that. So why aren't we getting you know, more agricultural? Actually, up in the Fluv, up in the um, northern part of Senegal, there's been some really great efforts on the part of a few different diaspora organizations creating jobs. Uh, but that's the exception. It's not the rule. I, I don't know about Burkina. Um, I do know that in Burkina, um, there are very few cardiologists in Burkina right now, but there are two in a very tiny little town in France. 